my name is uh, Ken Donovan. It's great to see a really good turnout. It's truly my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ron Stewart. Thank you. And um, before I do, I just want to say this is our 50th anniversary for a nonprofit. We own and operate four museums. Four museums in the north end of Sydney. And you know why we have survived for 50 years? Because of people like you. You come out to our meetings, you come to our exhibit openings, you take your friends and relatives to our museums. That's why we have survived. Thank you for your support. So if you can join us, a membership is $10 for a single, a family is 15, and $100 is sustaining, and uh, that's uh, get a charitable receipt for them. So your support is greatly appreciated. And the more members we have, the greater leverage we have with uh, various funding partners. So thank you for coming out to hear Dr. Ron. And uh, now I'm going to uh, introduce him. Uh, Dr. Ronald Stewart, Officer of the Order of Canada, member of the Order of Nova Scotia, member of the Executive Council of Nova Scotia, former Minister of Health for the province of Nova Scotia, and former member of the Provincial Bar of Parliament, was, grew, was born and grew up not too far from here, in Cape Breton. And he's going to be telling you about that. Following the graduation from Acadia University, he studied medicine at Dalhousie University, and then he took up practice in Niels Harbor. And uh, he quickly got to know everybody north of Smoky. And that's when he got to know Barb and I, especially Barb, because she was having a baby at the time. And that was a few years ago. <laughs> From there, he entered the residency program in emergency medicine at the University of Southern California, where he was one of the pioneers in emergency medical medical care both in and outside the hospital. Following his residency, he was appointed the first medical director of the paramedic program of Los Angeles County. And that's a pretty big and famous county. From there, he was offered the post of professor and chief of emergency medicine at the University of Pittsburgh and medical director of public safety of that city. And we all know Pittsburgh is famous today for what? Well, Number 87. <laughs> During this time, he was elected founding president of the National Association of Emergency Medical Services Physicians. Their prestigious award of excellence is named after him. He returned to Canada in 1987 as professor at, of surgery at the University of Toronto before returning to his alma mater at Dalhousie in 1989. He was elected to the legislature of Nova Scotia in the election of 1993, and he served in the province as Minister of Health and Register General from 1993 to 1996. And he commit, continued as a member of the legislature until 1997. Uh, now, get what he has done. He has been active in overseas projects in Australia, New Zealand, <clears throat> Africa, the Republic of Niger, in Cuba and throughout the Caribbean. And beginning in 1996, his involvement in the campaign to ban anti-personnel mines carried him to the United Nations. The International Committee of the Red Cross in Geneva, in London, as well as Berlin, and other world capitals, as well as remote areas of countries affected by the war. <coughs> Dr. Stewart recently held a position of professor and director of Medi medical humanities at Dalhousie, and currently holds joint appointments as professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine, as well as professor emeritus in faculties of medicine and of health professions. He holds a lifetime honorary appointment to the Executive Council of Nova Scotia, basically the Cabinet, and he's been awarded two honorary degrees. Tonight he's going to speak to us on the Baron and the Boy from Black River. 
an account of Kate Breckner's journey from 19th century boyhood to a life dedicated to changing the face of surgery. Would you please give Dr. Ronald Stewart a warm up? Uh, thank you very much, Ken. I, I have to remind everyone that that, that uh, resume was written by my mother, rest her soul. Uh, <laughs> so you realize that she had a bit of pride, and I'm sure it was a bit misplaced at times. Nonetheless, uh, I thank you for coming out on such a night. But I'm I'm not uh, I'm not ashamed of saying that I worked to get here too. I live in the woods of Bulladry and I had to snowshoe up almost a kilometer of uh, all uphill too, and. Uh, I just wanted to say what I want to say to you tonight, and I hope that you feel as you leave, even though the weather's so bad, that it was worth coming out. Because I've met so many of you that I haven't seen in years. One particular one who hauled me out of a car once on the Cabot Trail, which we won't talk about, please, uh, tonight. Um, tonight I want to take you on a, on a trip. And it's a, it's a trip, it's actually several trips, it's 22 times back and forth between here and Scotland. So uh, uh, strap on your, your uh, seasick pills because uh, we have a long way to travel together. But I hope that, um, that I can make the point that even though we're a little island stuck out like a defiant fist into the Atlantic, that we matter. And we must never forget that, not through arrogance, but rather through the humility that the gifts that we've been given uh, afford to us. The person I'm going to talk about is, um, is uh, known to some of you, I don't doubt, especially anyone who's a physician here, because he holds a place in our um, in our history at Dalhousie. And this coming year, 2018 actually, um, we celebrate the 150th year of Dalhousie Medical School. And this figures into my story tonight because uh, you can see, you'll see how John Stewart uh, actually played a role as a student, uh, but also he was uh, well known for some other things they did, which I'll mention as we go along. Here we are, as I said, right in the way of anyone trying to get to the southern climes. They stopped off for a while here, our ancestors did, and never left. That's not unusual. A lot of people do step here. And lately, of course, just one we're kind of worried may do that. But uh, on the other hand, if he doesn't, then we'll have a lot of other people coming. Apparently, that, I think that was a brilliant, fun thing to do. <laughs> Whatever politics we uh, embrace, uh, that the fact that someone with the innovation in his head, I, I, I really had to, because if you look at this website, and you must do that, please. It's called Donald Trump, uh, come to Cape, don't come to Cape Breton, or whatever it is. You'll, you'll find it, just Google it. But it's fantastic. But we, no matter what our ethnic origin, whether it be black, whether it be white, whether it be any shade therein, whether it be whatever. This island here, especially through its indigenous people and also later with the immigration from Europe, this island represents a diversity. And that diversity was driven initially after the Aboriginal settlement, which was many, many thousand years ago. Uh, it was decided by events in Europe. And if you look at the forces, especially in the 19th century, and I'm going to concentrate on the 19th century uh, t today, if you look at what drove those people here, there are various reasons. The Highland clearances we all know about. England needed wool for its uh, factories. The Industrial Revolution was starting in the Victorian age, and so the wool was important the tenant farmers were not. And so they were shifted off, sheep were moved in, and many of them had, and indeed had to go, through economics and probably a little bit more than economics. The Highland clearances then 
uh, were one of the, was one of the um, events and one of the forces that were driving people westward uh, to, to the New World. Poverty and famine, the Irish potato famine, the famines in the highlands, and there were such, uh, also played a role. And then there were religious migrants. There were those who came out, not necessarily because of poverty, although they certainly had a taste of that when they got here, but they came out because they were sent by the missionary societies of various faiths. And then economic migrants. There were those who simply said, we need a better life, we're not being able to feed our families, and maybe the new world is what we need. And they would go to where they felt the home ties were still there. And in Cape Breton, it happened to be the highland areas and some of the lowland, uh, lowlanders as well. But you can see that these events were happening uh, far away from us. And they got here and said, where did we ever come? What, what is going on here? Well, you can imagine them coming up the coast of Inganish and Smoky, and, and it, it must have been just daunting, which we can't really appreciate. I mean, we have, although we complain about the ruts in the road, there's nothing like they had. And, of course, they met some people they never knew before. And, of course, the winters were quite severe, and, by the way, still are, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and the one person that came out because of this religious fervor was a man by the name of Murdoch Stewart. Murdoch Stewart was a noted uh, scholar in Scotland. He was, in fact, he had the equivalent of a doctor of divinity. He spoke some Gaelic, although he said he'd rather preach in Latin than Gaelic. I'm not sure that he said that out, out loud, but... His diary, which is in the Nova Scotia archives, is fascinating to read. Uh, his impressions, uh, particularly of the countryside, um, were, really are worth reading. Keep in mind that these people were coming to a very poor uh, economic uh, situation. They were not uh, really funded very well at all, and often had to fight for their stipend um, in terms of what they were met with. He was, however, uh, appointed to a charge which was just west of St. Peter's at a place called Black River. And Black River uh, is now Dundee, the Dundee Resort. The ch church is still there, as I'll show you. But in any event, Mur Murdoch Stewart came out to, to, for three years, stayed here three years, and then went back to Scotland. Now, he went back to Scotland after he had made some preparations for his return because he had uh, plans to get married. He was going over there to fetch a wife, come back and raise a family, um, and indeed, that's what he did. In doing so, he decided, as most of the tradition was in the Presbyterian Church at that time, is that you had to educate your family after feeding them, maybe before, too, because that was a tradition in that particular faith community, that education was extremely important, and in fact, the driving force that you would see uh, in, in institutions ar arising in the New World very soon after they arrived. The Normal College, for example, which we'll see. Dalhousie University uh, was founded largely because the other universities that had been founded before it required the tenets of faith of that particular faith community to be adhered to. So if you were going to say in effects, you had to adhere to the Roman Catholic uh, dicta. If you were going to, uh, to the um, Baptist Acadia, uh, then you would have to at least be sympathetic, although it was a little bit more informal there, um, and so on. Governor Dalhousie of the colony decided he wanted a free and open university made in the image of the University of Edinburgh. He was a graduate of the University of Edinburgh. His castle, Dalhousie Castle, was just north of Edinburgh. And he wanted a free and open university which, was not, uh, which did not require the adherence to any particular creed. And so Dalhousie was founded, but he didn't have any money. 
And so after the War of 1812, the British actually during the war had captured the port of Castine in Maine. And they saw to the way all of the customs duties during the war. And then at the end of the war, just before the treaty was signed, they sailed off to Halifax with all of that money in the holds of the ship. And Lord Dalhousie had his university. So Dalhousie was paid for by the Americans. <laughs> so I wanted to send a thank you note to Donald Trump that we didn't build a wall, we built a university. The, this was the tradition from which Murdoch Stewart came. And so there, after he returned with his wife, uh, a couple of years later, he had a son, one of ten children. The first son and the first child was John Stewart, born in what was a frame home, really. It's been said he was born in a log cabin. Well, it doesn't really matter. It was a frame home. But nonetheless, um, it was a little bit more palatial, if you would. Um, but when you think of what was going on at the time, and if you think back, and I'll take you back to Europe in a, in a second to see what was going on, because there, 1848 was the age of revolution. Everything was changing. The French kicked out the people who chopped people's head off, and they restored the monarchy who also chopped people's head, heads off. And it was uh, an upheaval. In Britain, it took a dif different form. <coughs> Rather than marching in the streets with the barricades and giving rise to a popular musical, uh, rather, they went the legislative way. The Reform Acts of the 1840s and 1850s in, uh, in London, in Britain in general, uh, really were revolutionary. They actually tried to do something about the tremendously bad conditions uh, during the early part of the Victorian era. And in Scotland, a different, it took a different turn, and it was a religious turn. The established Church of Scotland went through in 1843 what was called the Great Disruption. I love these words that are sort of hide what was really happening <laughs> behind the scenes. There was a major disruption in the Church of Scotland, and a large number of clergy and adherents left the established church to form the Free Church of Scotland, of which Murdoch Stewart was one of those ministers. That church had a very evangelical element within it. And so, after 1843, 1845, we see a significant um, uh, missionary activity happening. And Murdoch Stewart was one of those. Now, I mention this uh, not because I was born and bred in that culture, but rather because that was a major driver in terms of what um, you see on this side of the Atlantic, especially in terms of education and in terms as well uh, of economics, because after education, one had to be very frugal in Calvinism and spend your money well, or even better, <laughs> save it. And um, you can see this working through as we trace John Stewart's life throughout um, both in, this, uh, in the New World as a youth and also later. His education was first of all at home, then at a little schoolhouse, and then his father decided he's need, he needs to go on. And so the place to go on during the 19, well, the 1850s, 1860s, was, was the school in Truro. Again, by a very evangel evangelical free church minister who founded a school for boys and girls, and also went on to found a teacher's college, which was called the Normal School. And so John Stewart was sent at the age of 13 or so to initially the private school of Dr. Alex, uh, of Dr. Alexander Forrester, and then went on to the Normal School, whence he learned something about teaching and came back to Sydney Academy the next year. So in 1867-68, he was at the academy teaching. I unfortunately can't find very much in the way of information 
on his time here in Sydney. It was relatively short, um, but he was called back to Black River to his home there because his father's sister in Scotland needed help with her farms. So in 1868, he gets on a bark leaving from Picto and he sails off back to the homeland and thence on to Edinburgh where he got very interested in the classics and started to study uh, history. He studied Greek and Latin. He could read the Aeneid in the original language uh, as, for fun. Now anyone who does that for fun, believe me, having got, gone through that, it's no fun. <laughs> so we have him back there, and for whatever reason, and I can't find it yet, but I'm looking, he got interested in medicine. He wanted to be a physician. Now, being a physician was quite a bit different than being a surgeon, with apologies to Dr. Uh, the surgeon wasn't the same thing, but it was becoming a recognized part of the healing professions. In fact, it was quite a bit. The, the, the 18th century wasn't very kind to, to surgeons. The 19th century was much more. He decided he was going into medicine, and he heard that Dalhousie had opened a new medical school in 1868, and indeed he, it, it did. It had a school, and so he came back to Nova Scotia and started his studies at Dalhousie in 1872. Now, the usual course of, of uh, academics at Dalhousie was to do the first two preclinical years at Dal, and then the students would either go to Harvard or go back to Edinburgh. The school was modeled upon the Edinburgh model. Uh, of, of, of uh, There was some scientific basis for what they were doing. Not all schools had that, um, but in this case it did. And so he decided to go back to Edinburgh because he liked it. Uh, it was enjoyable. It was his homeland, as you, if you would. And so off he went to the University of Edinburgh, enrolled in the, in the course in uh, 1872, and he, in 1874, rather. And that's when he, his life changed completely. Completely changed. But what did he go back to? What was the society like? Because we as physicians often... Uh, in fact, are molded by our, our society in which our community in which we practice. And if you look at the Victorian age, um, it wasn't really that great. You look at life expectancy compared in the 19th century to the 21st century, and you can see the, the, the difference. Now, we'll talk about why that difference, but look at the difference. Now, combined, we expect to live to 81 minimum. Uh, those of you who are over that age or are very near that age, that doesn't mean you're going to suddenly die at the age of 81, I hope. Um, I'm hoping. Um, but you can see this was pretty stark. 50% of the kids born would not survive their first three to five years of life. And just begin to think, why was that? What was the big difference? What, what was the difference? Well, let me introduce you to two people, or to, uh, one person at least right now. He was a Hungarian, and he was a rather poorly educated physician, but he, was, he became active in the hospital um, in Vienna. And he noticed that while he was doing his work, <coughs> that there was a problem with death of mothers. They died of what was called puerperal fever or infection. This man's name was Semmelweis, and he actually was one of the first people who identified that there was some kind of thing that was transmitted. There were two clinics delivering women at the time in his hospital. One was an outpatient clinic, and the delivery was done there by midwives. The other was a clinic, which was at the top of the graph there, and they did their 
deliveries in hospital, in his hospital. But they did the deliveries quite often after they had left the dissecting room and the autopsy suites and went over to the delivery suites to deliver the women. The death rates you can see there and the infection rates were entirely different, such that when the women were admitted to the hospital, they would beg to go to the blue clinic there and not to go to the other one. They knew. Word got out. And you would have women who would delay their delivery until they were being transported to the hospital so they would be admitted to another ward altogether and not subject to medical students and their teachers doing their examinations on them. Semmelweis noticed this too. And so he set up a system whereby those who were in the dissecting room, all the physicians and the students, would have to wash their hands in chlorinated lime and would have to do that with their instruments as well. And he was able to decrease the mortality by a factor of five. In other words, he did, but he didn't know why this was happening. He thought they were transferring on their person and on their instruments bits of cadaver and so on. And that would be infecting the women or, or causing this disease. They didn't, he didn't know it was infection. He thought it was. But in any event, this was one of the first things that figured later into some of the work that John Stewart came up against in Denver. If we look a little bit and look at 1900 and 2010 as to the mortality, what, what kills us here? And if you look at the bottom three squares there, the bottom three, and then a couple of other squares up, there were infections. It was an infectious disease process. If you go to where we are now, it's long-term chronic illness. It's cardiovascular disease. But let me show, and I'm sure that many of us here will not know this, that for the first time in 2008 in the United States, and I'm using the United States because they have the most accurate figures. For the first time ever, the number of fatalities in car accidents were less than drug overdoses. And the drug overdoses, up to 80% of them, were prescription drugs. I did not know that. I should know that. I'm at a medical school. I suspect that they were high, but I didn't know this. And you can see where the disease patterns have changed. John Stewart was confronted with the fact that people were dying of infection, especially after surgery. We're confronted with things that are lifestyle related. And so the, the forces were, that were at work were not understood. John Stewart came upon this when he joined the Faculty of Medicine at the uh, at, uh, University of Edinburgh, they knew something was transmittable, but they didn't know quite what it was. And then in the late 1940s, a man by the name of John Snow came along in London, and he was asked by the London Town Council to go out and find out why are people dying of cholera? What, what's going on here? And so he went to the source, the reliable source of data collection. Very reliable because they're down there in the streets all the time and they know who died and they know what they died of. And there they are there. They're not the aristocrats of London. They were the women of the street. They were the prostitutes of the street and they gave him the information. So and so died and he made a map with little pins in it. You can see it here, reproduction. And at the center, right in the center of all of those deaths, was a pump. And that pump was called the Broad Street Pump. And it was supplying water to those areas around there. And so he convinced, with some difficulty, the town council to take the handle off the pump. And the cholera went away. There was something in the water. And so he convinced them, the city council, to truck in water, to not use this pump. And in fact, that was 
the first epidemiological study that actually produced a measurable result. John Stewart knew about this. He contributed to the work that his mentor was going to do with him, as we'll see. But there were other things happening too, lest we think that everything is about infections and doctors who give pills and whatever. And one was an aristocratic lady who thought that hospitals were in pretty bad shape. But worse than that, the care given to wounded soldiers was in worse shape. And so she took herself, and she could do this because she was an aristocrat, and she could get into the, 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 the very halls of parliament. And she would persuade people to do what she wanted them to do. And she was a very forceful personality, and she lived till she was 90 years old. And her name was Florence Nightingale. Not only that, but she changed the profession, which wasn't even a profession. The ladies that you saw from the streets of London were the people who people the hospitals. They were the nurses, in quotes, because no one else would do that. No one would, no self-respecting woman would allow themselves to be put in a situation where they were cart and bedpans, or even worse, where they were seeing men naked and all the rest of it, it just wasn't done. She changed that. And she didn't take no for an answer. She was absolutely. Now, this picture you see here is supposedly the lady with the lamp. If she had a lamp, she probably hit someone over the head with it. <laughs> she was someone who was defined, definitive, and she won every fight she got into. She, was, she didn't go around to the soldiers and take care of them. She had people who were trained to do that. She did her job as a leader. But when I see this lamp, I just think I, I wouldn't go near her with that lamp. Um, and, and she then turned her attention to the slums of Edinburgh, which John Stewart just had arrived in pretty well, and in London. And she got the reforms uh, passed through Parliament. She was one of the chief people who had done this. And there was another one, a German, a German by the name of Rudolf Virchow. He not only was uh, a pathologist, a fantastic scientist, but he was a social scientist. And he, God love him, he went into Parliament. And he had the public health changed. We had a vote in the medical school last year or so. What were the greatest advances in medicine and health care in the last 150 years? And do you know what the first one on the list was? And I was very proud of this. Now, I must say I did sort of browbeat them into doing this. But, <laughs> but uh, uh, I didn't do that with elections. Maybe I should have tried it. But <laughs> in any event. Um, do you know what the top one? Can you guess what the, what the I, I, I'm sure you can't guess what medical students think, but anyone want to guess? Wash their hands. You're close. It was the toilet. Mm -hmm. Sewage. Mm -hmm. And you're right. They're pretty right. They're pretty close. It was the fact that you can't have poverty and you can't have people throwing their you know, wastes out the window and landing on your head, which happened, and then consider that everyone's going to be healthy. You can't do it. And so he developed the sewage systems of Berlin. He passed laws. He helped pass laws. He had a terrible enemy in Bismarck, who was the opposition. Uh, but nonetheless, he, what he said, and you can see where he was physician-centric. He, he looked at what physicians could do. And he said, we were the advocate of the poor. We may have lost a little bit of that. But I think we've changed the color of it, maybe changed what we say. But, and the other is that medicine is a social science. Now, we believe, and we believe at Dalhousie, I mean, that people who said it to me, and I sort of thought, that's pretty good. I'm not sure I lived it as well as I should have. But that it was a social science. And politics, that is public service, is medicine on a grand scale. And that is exactly why I did what I did.
And I knew it. I had it very focused, did it, and then got the heck out. Of course, I'd had a little help with the voters if I had ever gone back to them, but in any event. So this was all happening when this uh, young man came to Edinburgh, and then in 1874, his life changed when he met a man by the name of Joseph Lister. Now, Joseph Lister was troubled because he had up to 50% of his patients dying with his orthopedic uh, care of open or compound fractures. And there was just nothing appeared to work. And there were three basic theories as to what caused disease in that era. Lister was familiar with all of them. The first was that disease and, and disability and, and stuff happened spontaneously. That life just sort of sprung out of rotten meat and maggots were the result and so on. Even though in the 17th century, a man by the name of Reddy, uh, an Italian, he showed that if you protected a piece of meat with a cloth over the top of the bottle, as you can see here, you didn't get any maggots. If you opened it up, you did. So there couldn't be something generating itself from within. It had to be external. The other was the miasmic theory, that there were stench and garbage and excrement and so on. That produced clouds of atmospheric stuff that would float over the tenement buildings and so on. And we got sick from that. It didn't explain why some people got sick and some didn't, if this great cloud was coming around. And the other was divine intervention, which if you chuckle at that, just think back when the AIDS started, the AIDS, and what we heard from some people who should not have said what they said. And, 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 and that's not as unusual as you might think. And finally, someone solved much of the argument, and his name was Louis Pasteur. And Louis Pasteur was a chemist. He wasn't a doc, he wasn't a surgeon, he wasn't a physician, he was a chemist. And that was, in a way, a, a disadvantage, because John Stewart didn't read the chemical literature. Joseph Lister didn't le read the chemical literature. And remember, it's not like Googling. You, can't, you couldn't Google it. Today, ah, we have no trouble there. But they, they would have perhaps known about some chemical experiments going on. But they would not have read what Pasteur uh, wrote in the 1860s, in 18, late 1850s, actually, when he said that when he was called on because the wine was going sour in France, and that's a big industry. And so it was driven, his, his uh, experiments were driven by commercial issues. And he looked at, with his microscope, he looked and saw these little wee things floating around, swimming around, other than the big budding yeasts, which should be there. They were an infection that was bacteria were causing the change, as it did in, in milk, which he looked at as well. And he found that by heating it a little bit, just a little bit for a little short time, 30 minutes, you could destroy the bacteria. And that process, of course, was called pasteurization. He showed, for example, with three little flasks here. He would have a flask, he'd boil it, it had a swan neck, so air could get in, but anything on the air in the particles would settle to the, at the curve of the flask. But if you broke the flask off and the air entered and the particles in it, then they would become uh, spoiled. Very simple, but he published it and went on to study both the little microbes and, and so on. And, the, and then, surgery was changing. And a couple of things brought it about. First of all, surgery changed before, before Lister. Surgery was a matter of a surgeon had to cut quick. 
Why? Because there was no anesthesia. They tried alcohol occasionally and sometimes, but it was really brute force. That was the anesthetic. You just sat on the patient and chopped the leg off or whatever. This is a, a man by the name of Robert Liston, who was one of uh, England's most prominent surgeons. Lister, whom we'll meet in just a few minutes, was so taken by the stress of seeing someone in agony from an operation, it depressed him so that he went away with a severe depression for a whole year before he actually entered medical school. But just before he left, he was asked to come and see one of Liston's operations because they were going to use some Yankee thing that came over on the, on, on, with one of the, uh, one of the letters from, from Boston. And that letter was about the use of the ether at the Massachusetts General that uh, it was three weeks prior. So Liston, eh, he was going to try it. He didn't really think it would work, but he did an amputation. And there wasn't a sound of the patient, and he woke up and he couldn't believe he had gone through the operation. Lister still didn't think that that was going to be widely adopted, so he was quite, quite, um, he felt it was unattractive a profession for him. Liston, by the way, has the record of, in terms of when, how quick you could lop a leg off. It was a, a, exactly 62 seconds. But at one time, he lopped the leg off, and he had a 300% mortality rate. How did he do that? Well, he was doing the operation so quickly, and by the way, the patient died, which was expected. So that's one. That's 100%. <laughs> but one of his assistants, he cut his fingers along with the patient's leg, and he died of infection. And then his other assistant, he had swung the knife and cut his coat. The assistant thought he had actually cut him and had a heart attack and died. 300%. Not a good, not a, not a particularly attractive piece of data there. Um, but look at the amputation rates and the mortality rates, rather. And this is from the various countries. So it's not as if it's any one particular thing. They died of infection, up to 70%. And if you, if you understand that the hospitals, the Royal Infirmary in Edinburgh, uh, was not the clean, pristine. And if you think we have troubles uh, you know, keeping clean in the hospitals these days, and we do, but the hospitals require a lot of work to do that. Um, this was terrible. There were no bathrooms. There were later on in the infirmary, in the Royal Infirmary. But, so back in Scotland, here's, here, is, here are two men who have, whose lives now have intersected. John Stewart from Black River and Joseph uh, Lister from London. Joseph Lister was a Quaker, as we'll see later whose father was a quite, quite, quite a well-known um, inventor. He actually invented the achromatic lens and microscopy, that is the use of microscopes and so on, was very much enabled by his work. But here is what these two men shared, which I think were absolutely um, formative in both of their lives. It's clear from two years of study of the correspondence between Lister and Stewart, that Lister considered John Stewart to be a surrogate son. Joseph and Agnes, his wife, were childless. And Lister adopted, in quotes, uh, John Stewart. I'm, I have no doubt of that. And they maintained a lifelong friendship, which was very intimate and very, very um, uh, productive for each of them. They both had influential mothers and strong fathers as well who instructed them and protected them and they had a classical education first at home and then formally. In addition to that they were driven 
very much by their faith. Now, I have to be careful here because I don't want you to think that they're out there preaching on the, on the street corner while they were you know, doing their operations. They weren't. However, they were very, very faithful people. Um, it is probable that both of them prayed before many operations. Not everyone, but many operations. They did it, however, after the chloroform was given. Because I don't think you'd want the, the dog coming in. <laughs> well, if you don't know what, if you, uh, anyway. Um, but they were very, and, and, and very much so, because when Lister, with his new regimen of carbolic acid treatment for open wounds and for surgical instruments, when he devised that and when he taught John Stewart this, they had a new gospel. And they went out preaching the gospel of Listerism. It started in Edinburgh, Nova Scotia, and so on. Stuart came back 20, 22 times, back and forth from, to home. And this was something that bound them together. At the end, the, the letters that I'm reading from Lister to Stewart, at the end of Lister's life, he died in 1912, Stewart in 1933, they were discussing things of real spiritual importance. And they were bound by those. They were sensitive people. Lister probably had one that was called nervous breakdown. That's a euphemism for depression, most likely. He had it just after the Liston uh, after he saw the Liston operation. Uh, Stewart actually was also, twice in his life, t took a year off, six months off. I don't know how a surgeon could take a year off and then come back to his practice, but he did. He was in Halifax at the time. Um, and he went to Europe to, to take the waters and to, you know, to, uh, to, uh, to treat himself, I think, although he may have had formal treatment. I don't know. Uh, there were evidence-based and they were very humble. In fact, uh, Lister was uh, quite impaired at times with stutter. He had a, a, a marked stutter, which, were, which got better as he got older, but it was certainly there. And then they were schooled in rhetoric. They could really hold, a, hold an audience and convince people. So let's have a little bit of a closer look and then end up. So you can see where fate was bringing these people together. Both had these strong fathers. The Quaker in Lister never went away, even though he married outside the faith. He married an Anglican. And as a result, he could not be a Quaker any longer. The community disfellowshipped him. But he continued a very close relationship with his family and to his final days, used the usual Quaker form of address as the second person singular, thee and thou, with his family, not with anyone else. Um, his father was uh, a member of the Royal Society because of his work with achromatic lenses. Stewart came from an entirely different set of circumstances. Lord Joseph Barron, uh, Lord Joseph Lister, he was made of Baron by uh, Victoria. He actually operated on Queen Victoria um, and got some carbolic acid in her eye. She was not amused. Uh, he was devoted to his science and to his regimen that he developed. And Stuart adopted it and became his closest disciple. And then the influences, as we said, were significant in both Calvinism and, and, and Quakerism. And this, is, th this was their path. This was Stuart's path. They had separate paths with, which came together. And they were united in the belief that if Listerism, that is the use of carbolic acid and special bandaging, it wasn't just the carbolic acid, and much is made of the carbolic acid, which uh, I can tell you really depended on another chemist. 
Thomas Anderson was the chief of chemistry at the University of uh, Edinburgh when Lister was there, and they used to go on long walks together. And Anderson once said, after Lister was saying how terrible his infection rates were and how people were dying, and he was very depressed over it, and Anderson said, you should read the work of Louis Pasteur in France. He's written in the chemistry literature, so you should send and try and get his papers, which he did. And Lister was the man who adopted the idea of putrefaction and fermentation to what really was the infection that he was seeing. So when it was wine, the wine became vinegar. When it was in the patient, in tissue, it became sepsis or infection. And so then, on another walk, he was wondering how he was going to do something about this. Anderson said, well, I've heard that in the village of Carlisle, next to Edinburgh, they treat their sewage in the summer to stifle its stench with carbolic acid or phenol. Maybe you could do the same thing with tissue. Now, carbolic acid is not a friend of tissue. <laughs> you have to dilute it quite a bit, 121 and 40. But Blister said he'd try it. And so you see where chemistry and medicine and other things and Florence Nightingale and her social work, it all came together. It's a mistake to think that the work of Stewart and Lister alone produced the results that we see, that they saw in the reduction of mortality. It was really the improvement of hospitals and the rise of the nursing profession. And we mustn't forget that. And the work that the legislators did, such as Virchow, to confine um, uh, the septic material to to the proper place, in, the, in this case, the sewers and so on. So the big problem was the resistance of the medical profession and the medical establishment. They rejected officially the idea of the germ theory and the idea that carbolic acid regimen was, in fact, any use at all. In fact, it took the Americans until the 1890s. Now, there were exceptions, definitely. And a lot of work was done by individual Americans to, to do that. And they studied in, in Edinburgh. And Canada had quite a representation there in Edinburgh. But generally, the associations, the medical associations, rejected this. And people continued to die. So it was tremendously frustrating to both of them, but they persisted. And Lister decided that if I'm going to make an impact and make this work, I've got to go to the center of medicine in the world. And that was London in that era, in the 1860s, 1870s. It was London. And so he was offered a chair of clinical surgery in, at King's College Hospital. And he asked two of his students to go with him. There were actually two others, but they weren't graduated. And the closest friend that he had, John Stewart, he was invited to come to London with Lister, and he went. But, and this is a lesson for us all, and I know anyone born in this island or anyone who have come and loved it as much as we do understand why he came home. He was there less about a year with Lister. And then I've just finished reading the letter to his mother, where he told his mother, I have to come home. Now, his obituary says he had to come home to take care of his family because his father had died. His father was preaching fire and brimstone down in White Cockama for four years after he came home. It wasn't, they weren't destitute. They were very well taken care of. They were happy. And it, was, it had nothing to do with the family. It had to do with what he says, it is my duty to come home. And I love the country. And he did. Walked around Meat Cove and up in Bear Mountain and all of that stuff, just for fun. So and I think any of us would understand that here. But he became a leader in the country and was able to 
do all of the things that he probably couldn't do from London, he would have been the successor of Lister. I have no doubt about that. However, he came home and then became a consultant from Picto because they moved to Picto. His, his uh, brother had a very active law practice and his father retired in 1882 and they, uh, the whole family went to Picto. But from Picto, he went to Yarmouth, he went to Wicogma, back here to Cape Breton and to Sydney, and he did uh, consulting and surgery. And Listerism was well established. It was being used months later, actually, the regimen in, uh, in Dalhousie and in the hospitals in Halifax. He became president of the CMA, he became president of the uh, Provincial Medical Board, several times Medical um, Society of Nova Scotia, he was decorated, and at the age of 68, he, became, he went off to war. He went off to World War I and became the supervising, he became the colonel in chief of Dalhousie No. 7 Stationary Hospital. Was decorated by the king, and then when he came back, he was our first official dean from 1919 to 1932, actually. He died in 1933 and was afforded a major funeral that I don't think Halifax has seen since. And so what do we say of him? Well, we do matter. We are people who, with hard work, which we're not adverse to and we're not unfamiliar with, we can make a difference whether we're born in a log cabin on the door or whether we're born in a mansion. It makes little difference in the long run. And what makes the difference? Education, drive, I think our belief that there's something greater than what we do. And he was an example. So for the upcoming celebrations of the 150th, I hope to finish this uh, book that I'm doing on uh, John Stuart and Lister. But more than that, we're going to be applying to the uh, National Sites and Monuments Board to declare John Stuart a person of national significance and have a, uh, a postage stamp done. So I may be back to you uh, with a petition or two, and I'll be coming here every night. So we have something to be very proud of. He, he never forgot Cape Breton. He was always a Cape Bretoner, as was his family. And I think we all will be as well. I hope this was helpful. I hope that it was worth this terrible weather. And I thank you for the invitation and the honor of being here for the 50th anniversary of this marvelous organization. Thank you very much. We've got a little, bit, a little bit of time for questions. I went a little bit over, but not too bad. Four minutes. So, questions? Yes, yes. Indeed, it is. Yeah, that has died out, unfortunately, but we're going to reinstitute it. Uh, one of the, uh, and I didn't want to get too tec technical, but I did, uh, I, had, I had a picture actually of it. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that Lister did that he later said, I'm sorry I ever did this, was he correctly believed that the germs, let's call them germs, were on the dust particles of the air and they were floating around, which is true. Um, the big change in surgery came later, and the Americans were very much in the forefront, and that is aseptic surgery, which meant you sterilized everything before you even started, including skin and so on. This was treating the, treating the bugs that got there already. So in order to get at the air, he developed a, an aerosol spray. It actually... And, and actually, the medical students were very, oh, they were very bad in, in, the, in the Victorian age. They heckled and they, they I, was, I, I was fortunate. I never, you know, I, to be 100 years later, 200 years later. Um, 
the, he would come in and to do the operation, and the spray machine would be brought in, which was a Bunsen burner, which produced steam, and it, it sucked up the, uh, the carbolic acid, and, then, and the whole room would be fogged. The surgeon's hands would be dripping. They'd be breathing it in. There are several deaths attributed to, to, to carbolic acid in, inhalation. And so one smart bunny at the back of the class would say, let us spray. <laughs> and and in, the, in the sole incident that was recorded, Lister merely looked up as what he would never get upset. He, he looked up and looked at the miscreant and just bowed his head. And, you know, in other words, you're a lost cause, you're a loser. <laughs> but the actual spray, when he left, Lister gave him one of the spray machines. Now, uh, it was the 1880s that Lister said, look, this really, I'm sorry that this ever happened. I didn't, I was, he said, this is my most regrettable thing I've done in my practice. But it wasn't all that bad. But the surgeons had a terrible time with it because they had, it, it shrinks your skin up, it's irritating, it's awful. And, and um, you know, if, if you think you could get 70 million for talcum powder, and it was, you heard on the news lately, <laughs> boy, I'll tell you, they could get a lot more with this carbolic acid. <laughs> so yes, we have, and we have the original thing that that Lister gave him, and um, it's kept in the humanities office. Now I'm gonna tell you something, I, I think you should turn the film off, but, um, <laughs> I came in as the new director of humanities and I found the spray machine. It was in a Toby's bag under the desk. <laughs> and I thought, this is terrible. I never, uh, this is sacrilege. What's going on? And, and I took it out and it was ratty looking. It was brass, it's pure brass. It's probably worth a million dollars on the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the market. Yeah. Um, so I took it home. I said, I'm going to clean this up. So I got brass all clean. Took it all apart, every screw, everything. Took it all apart. Brilliant, beautiful, brilliant. And I couldn't get it back together again. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what I did? Here's where Google comes in. I went over to the, and this was early Google. I typed in, you know, plan for a Lister spray machine. And up comes the very illustration and blueprint for that machine, which is number 80 in the series of this company in London. And I put it all back, less one screw. I didn't have, I lost one screw. <laughs> so, yes, Al, that was important. Okay, yeah. What's your, what's your relationship to your grandfather? Or well, it depends on what audience I'm speaking to. <laughs> since, it's, since it's you folks and you know me, I, is no relation whatsoever. <laughs> if, however, it were on the other side of the border or someone else, well, he's a very, very close relation. <laughs> 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 yes, yes, sir. Um, Lister's uh, as a depression were really well documented. You mentioned that they shared that in common. I just wondered about uh, John Stewart, if you had any information. Uh, yeah, I, John Stewart definitely did have two episodes in which he took, in one case, a year off and went to Europe, and it was not. And, and his sister, who writes the, the account, says he had a nervous breakdown. That was often, that covered a multitude of anything, you know, it's just not accurate enough. It usually meant it was a mental collapse of some kind or, a, or an anxiety attack or repeated anxiety attacks or a depression. We take it now mostly to mean a depression or maybe a manic um, phase or a depressive phase of a, a more serious illness. Uh, it's hard to say and I have to really be careful because um, you're torn as a biographer even an amateur like myself. So you're torn between being an idol worshiper and being you know, trying to, to dig too much and get information that may not be accurate. And I err on the side of, you know, trying to be accurate and trying not to uh, over-diagnose, if you would. But I, I suspect it was. Both were very sensitive. I mean, you, you read his letters and how he treated kids. Uh, he was the same, um, for example, Lister, came on ward rounds once and this little girl, and it was the kids who really, uh, if you would see a Victorian hospital ward with kids with TB, everyone had TB. 
And these kids had bony abscesses and had to be dressed and curated and curated and stuff. And the little girl had a doll, and the arm of the doll was ripped, and the sawdust was coming out of it. So Lister, who was very busy, asked for a suture tray and came and sutured very slowly and carefully, sutured the little, and put it in a little sling and gave it back to the girl. John Stewart did the same just before he came home. He went to say goodbye to his patients in the infirmary. He was leaving the next day. And he came across a boy who had tuberculous humors. And um, he, he was very, you can see, he was telling his mother, he was very moved by this. And the little boy, uh, he said, you, you won't be dressing me anymore. You need changing bandages and so on. And John Stewart said, no, uh, I don't think you have to let Jesus take over. And the little boy looked at him and he said, I don't think he would do a better job than you do. <laughs> Thank you very much. There are cookies over here, and I want one of those cookies. <laughs> I know this man is very much revered north of Smokey, I know that for sure. And I was just wondering, you know, when we met with him and I read his CV, I said, how many thousands of people need his help? So he is definitely revered. But I'll tell you, when, he, uh, when we met with him, Barb and I, I was pretty impressed by how funny he was. And you notice tonight he was, had a straight face, but he was pretty good, right? We were all right. <laughs> so that's a real mark of a good speaker. So on behalf of everybody here, in the Old City Society. Oh, wow. I'm going to present Dr. Stewart with the Cape Breton Fiddle Companion. Oh, Liz wonderful. Doherty. Excellent. This is a marvelous book. You can get it at the Curiosity Shop for 25 bucks. I've read the whole thing once. Guarantee you'll love it. Great. Well, thank you Thank very you, much. Ken. That's wonderful. <laughs> thank you. Can I just say one more? I just want to say one thing. Um, I'm a very happy person. Most of the time. But I have someone here tonight who hauled me out of a car once back in 1972. And I had a second chance. And it's that second chance that I'm trying to live up to. I probably had a third and fourth that I didn't recognize. So it's no big deal. It's just the way it is. And I thank you for that. Thanks, folks. And thank you. Thank you.